hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar on public benevolent institutions and health promotion charities. A bit of a mouthful of a title but I'm sure um, those of you who have come along to listen will get a lot out of it. My name is Matt Crichton and I'm from the ACNC education team here and joining me to go over these two important charity categories is Al McIver who is a technical advisor at the ACNC. Hi Al. Hi Matt. Um, before we get into the uh, details of both categories today, just a few things to run through. If you do have any audio troubles, call the number in the email that um, you received upon registration. There's, there's a code in there and you can use your phone to access the audio. It sometimes is a better way if you're having trouble via the, um, your computer or, or phone, um, the internet browser, whatever you're using. Also, if you've got questions throughout, we're happy to answer them via text. On the in the GoToWebinar navigation panel, you should have an option in there to ask ask questions. We've got a couple of colleagues standing by to answer all the difficult questions you have ready to throw at them, and that's Nicola and Chris. So you'll receive um, responses from either Nicola or Chris throughout the webinar if you choose to take that path and ask a question. Otherwise, we will have um, some time for questions and answers uh, at the end of the formal presentation whereby Al and I will um, answer some of the, the, the more general and useful for everybody, the questions that are useful for everybody. If we don't get to your question, if many are coming through, um, don't worry, we will make an effort to get um, in touch with you via email. And of course, keep your uh, questions general. It's a better rule rather than getting into the specifics of your particular organisation. In many cases, that depends on many details that we don't have at hand and you're better off giving us a call and having a, a proper chat about the details of your organisation, what you need to do rather than a question in a yeah. webinar forum. And we do record these uh, sessions and send a follow-up email to everyone within a day or two of having finished the webinar. So. No need to scribble down every single note on the screen and every URL that we show you. That will be included in the follow-up email and you will have access to the slides from that email as well. So look out, that, look out for that in the next couple of days. Okay, having said all that, let's go through what we'll cover today. First, we'll have a look at the significance of both of these charity categories. We'll have an explanation of both of them, Public Benevolent Institution and H. A health promotion charity. As you can see there in brackets, we've got the initials PBI and HBC. If we slip into using the initials throughout, forgive us, Public Benevolent Institution and Health Promotion Charity both have a lot of syllables. It can be easier to say PBI and HBC. So if you hear PBI, you know what we're talking about, HBC likewise. We'll go over some examples of, of what may and may not be considered um, charities for these categories. And we'll take a quick look at the registration requirements and the process and what the ACNC looks for in an application when we're assessing these categories. And of course, as I mentioned at the end, some audience questions. Okay, um, before I throw over to Al to go through some of the details of um, each category, we'll just have a touch on the significance of both of these categories. And for many organisations, it is tax concessions because both of them have a category set aside with the ATO to be endorsed for deductible, to be endorsed as a deductible gift recipient, which means that um, organisations can offer tax deductibility on the donations that they receive from donors. So it might be um, a valuable endorsement to have for many organisations. So if you're registered with the ACNC as a PBI or an HPC, it usually entitles you to endorsement as a DGR from the ATO. But an important note, and we've got that on the screen there, is that registration as either of these categories does not affect your, your regular ongoing obligations, your reporting obligations to the ACNC. Whilst it may open up the door to some um, tax concessions with the ATO, it doesn't give you any different reporting obligations to the ACNC. You still have to meet the regular reporting obligations as a, regular, as a registered charity. If you want to have a look at more detail in some of this, about some of this, there's some URLs down there at the bottom. The ones from the ACNC website are a bit shorter, acnc.gov.au forward slash obligations cover your regular charity obligations and acnc.gov.au forward slash DGR gives you an overview of the tax aspect as um, it is on our website. But if you want to have a look at the ATO's 
information about um, DGR and the categories. I've got a fairly long URL there, but as I said, that'll be in the follow-up email if you can't be bothered typing, writing that down now. Okay, enough from me for the time being. Let's have a look at the first category, Public Benevolent Institutions, PBIs, and I'll ask Al to take over and give us a broad overview of what this category is. Okay, thanks, Matt. Um, so, a PBI is an institution that provides benevolent relief as its main purpose, and that relief is provided to people in need. Uh, so, first off, it must be eligible for registration as a charity. Um, so, it, it must have an ABN, uh, it must have only charitable purposes, uh, it must be not for profit, all the usual uh, requirements. Right. Uh, then there are three uh, additional aspects uh, that it must satisfy. It must be public, it must provide benevolent relief, and it must be an institution. Okay, there's a, a, a bit to that. Um, we'll have a look at each of those aspects in a moment. Um, we'll start with probably the easiest of the three, public. What do we mean when we say there's a requirement that it's that it's public? Okay, so uh, the only essential requirement is that the class of beneficiaries must be extensive. So that means they must form a sufficient section of the community. So uh, if an organisation was only providing help to people from one family or uh, employees of a particular company or members of a private club, that would not be sufficiently public. Yeah, right. So it's too restricted. And even though in those cases that you just mentioned, there may be the other requirements met, that they are not public enough would mean that they would fail on this category. That's right. How about institution? This is a bit more tricky. It's one that often trips up some people in thinking about um, applying for a PBI. What, what does it mean? What do we mean by institution and the requirement that an organisation is an institution? An institution is an organisation which exists to translate the purpose as conceived in the mind of the founders into a living and active principle. So that means uh, the organisation must carry out a sufficient level of activities to to kind of bring to life the the purpose of the entity. So a mere trust or fund is not an institution because a trust merely manages and then disperses or gives away the money. Um, so that's not a sufficient level of activity. Okay, so it needs to be, uh, the organisation needs to be doing stuff, enough stuff, activities, to show that it's um, bringing about the um, the mission or the, the purpose as conceived of by the people that started the organisation. That's right, yeah. So it can't just, as you mentioned, a, a fund or, or a trust, simply is holding money and then giving off money. It's not doing anything more to bring about this purpose or mission. That's right. And just quickly, before we move on, on institution, if an organisation is planning to apply as a PBI, how can they show that they are an institution? Are there any uh, sort of classic things or activities that they can they can show that, that suggest they are more than just a mere trust or a fund? Uh, any any range of activities that goes beyond that of a mere trust okay. would be sufficient. So fundraising would be um, active fundraising would be sufficient, or um, actually delivering the relief themselves. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Now, just looking at the third option, the middle part of the phrase "public benevolent institution" is this concept of benevolence, benevolent relief. Um, again, it's a, it's a tricky one that trips up a lot of people when thinking about what their organisation does. Can you give us an overview of what we mean by benevolent relief? Sure. Uh, so, yeah, this is the the really key issue with uh, PBIs. So, um, they need to uh, be uh, relieving needs that are beyond the suffering experienced in everyday life. Okay. Um, and they must be sufficiently targeted to people in need. And there must be a clear mechanism for the delivery of relief. Uh, and relief does not have to be provided directly. Um, and it has to be the main purpose of, of the entity. Okay, so there's, there's, there's quite a bit there for benevolent relief. I might just take you back to one of the first things you said in explaining this was that it has to be beyond the 
um, suffering of everyday life, daily life. Um, can you just expand upon that for a moment? What, what do you mean by that? Sure. Uh, so the courts have stated that the stress and pain encountered in ordinary human ex ex experience, um, such as failure or loss of status and reputation, and even bereavement if uh, you lose, say, a, a grandparent, um, for example, uh, they are not serious enough to qualify as, as needs requiring, requiring benevolent relief. So, um, whereas, say, if uh, with bereavement, uh, if a, a parent lost a child, that would generally be considered uh, of such seriousness that it, it would ar arise, uh, arouse compassion or um, pity in the community. Okay. And that's the test that needs to be satisfied. Okay, right. So there is a little bit of flexibility there, and that will rest on the details of each particular organisation and, and what they are set up to do. That's right. But it must show that the relief that they are aimed at um, uh, helping is that which would um, bring about com compassion, a sense of compassion or, or pity in, in the general community. That's right. Yeah, it needs to be a serious need. Okay, and just on the second dot point here, it's specifically targeted to people in need. So just general support is, is not enough. You, you need to identify the people and, and the need. Yes, so you, you might have uh, a focus on social welfare issues, but if you're just educating the public, the general community on issues, then that's not targeting uh, a group which is in need of benevolent relief. Right. So it would, um, you would identify a group who is suffering such that they need a particular support or relief of, of the thing that they're suffering from, and, and that would be the benevolent relief. Yeah, that's right. Okay, and um, a couple more things to touch on before we move on to some examples. Um, all purposes must be directed at benevolent relief. Um, th does that mean that everything that the organisation does? Uh, so, yeah, the courts have used the term main purpose or dominant purpose or predominant purpose and uh, it's slightly misleading in that um, actually all the purposes have to be directed at benevolent relief or if there are purposes that are not directed at benevolent relief, they have to be just a means of achieving the benevolent relief. They have to be ancillary or incidental in that way. Okay, so they can't be um, independent purposes of themselves acting within the charity, they need to be aimed at that ultimate purpose of benevolent relief. That's right. Okay, and the, the clear mechanism aspect here, um, this one can be often misunderstood by people applying. What do we mean by clear mechanism for providing benevolent relief? Right, so um, say activities such as lobbying government or awareness raising, education, aimed at the general community or research, um, they don't have a clear mechanism for the delivery of relief. Um, so they, they may have a downstream consequence of relief of needs, but um, any actual relief is not an automatic consequence of what uh, um, the entity is doing. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> even, even though what, what they're doing is good and may even be charitable and may even lead to some benevolent relief further down the line, those sorts of activities don't don't have that clear mechanism, that, that link between the activity and, as you described, automatically, uh, the automatic relief of the needs of the people that need it. That's right. But it can be part of a formal collaboration. The final dot point here says it doesn't need to be direct. So does that mean that an organisation doesn't need to have people on the front line or in the street doing the work. It, it can be part of an organisation or a collaboration with others. That's right, yeah. So it could be a fundraising entity um, providing funds to a related entity as long as there's a relationship of collaboration or a common benevolent purpose between the two. Um, or an entity could be a peak body assisting member uh, public benevolent institutions, um, and it, it itself could be a PBI, um, or an organisation could contract agents to deliver the relief on its behalf. Okay, but even in these 
circumstances, the the um, collaboration needs to be working towards benevolent relief, right? Yes, that's right. There needs to be um, a, cl a um, clear mechanism for the delivery of, of relief. Um, so for a fundraising entity, clearly the funds are given to the related entity and the related entity provides the services on their behalf. Uh, okay. So there's a clear mechanism. So in a fundraising agency, it couldn't be that the fundraising agency gives a lot of their funds or, or most of their funds to an organisation that does, that they have an agreement with that does benevolent relief and then some other funds to another organisation. It wouldn't be a PBO. That's that right, yeah. yeah. It wouldn't have a main purpose of benevolent relief if, if it has an independent, right, non-benevolent relief purpose. Okay, all right. I think that does a good job of clearing up quite a tricky aspect of this um, category and the requirements for this category. If you wanted to read a little bit more, you can see down the bottom bottom left there, we've got a couple of URLs, acnc.gov.au forward slash PBI is a fact sheet which, well, it largely goes through some of the details that we've talked about here, but um, you, you can read through it at your own pace. And also acnc.gov.au forward slash CIS, which stands for Commissioner's Interpretation Statement. That's a, a statement that um, the Commissioner of the ACNC has put in writing about public benevolent institutions and other topics, but public benevolent institutions is one of them, which lays out how the ACNC understands the category and how it will apply the law as it currently stands. So if you wanted to have a look at that uh, statement, I recommend going to the website there, forward slash CIS. Let's move on. Okay, some examples. Um, so these are organisations that would all qualify. Generally, let's let's assume that mm. um, in, in most cases there aren't um, some, some anom anomalies that prevent them, but in most cases these would qualify as PBIs. They provide uh, benevolent relief to a targeted group of uh, people in need of that relief. Would you say these are the most common um, PBIs, Al? Uh, yes, they, uh, we get a lot of uh, these types of entities um, and say to take homeless shelters as an example, um, it would be providing relief of poverty and distress by providing accommodation and, and meals to homeless people and it's clearly targeting uh, relief to people who meet that criteria uh, of being homeless yep. and it, it doesn't restrict um, the people who can benefit, so it's a significant section of the community um, and obviously the distress and poverty faced by those people is uh, of such seriousness that it would arouse compassion in the community. Yeah, right. Okay. Let's move on and have a look at um, health promotion charities or as we'll probably refer to them from now, HPCs because it's quicker. Again, now can you give us an um, overview of what a health promotion charity is, an HPC? Sure. Uh, so this is a slightly misleading name um, because it's all about disease okay. rather than health promotion. Uh, so it's an institution that has the principal activity of promoting the prevention or control of disease in human beings. Uh, so Firstly, again, it must be eligible to register as a charity. Uh, it must be an institution, um, and then it must promote the prevention or control of disease. So those first two are similar to PBI, right? The yeah. same requirements. That's right. But the third one here, as you mentioned, it focuses heavily on disease. Can you, I, I know we all have a, a, a pretty sound understanding of what the word disease means, but can you give us an overview of, of what we're looking at when we're considering it within the context of a health promotion charity? Sure. Uh, so disease doesn't have a technical le legal meaning, it just takes its ordinary meaning. Okay. Um, so uh, the Macquarie Online Dictionary defines disease as a morbid condition of the body or of some organ or part or an illness, sickness or an ailment. So that pretty much aligns with what we generally think of when we think disease. Yeah, right. No, there's no hidden secret meanings that we apply when we assess uh, an application for an HPC. No. Okay, uh, and just um just on the uh, the third dot point here on the screen, although we mentioned 
also that the ACNC will be guided by the work of other leading health organisations. Of course, the ACNC itself isn't a leading health organisation, so we do rely on the expertise of others. Some examples being the World Health Organisation, the NHMRC. But we've got here that not everything that affects a person's mind or body is a disease, even though the the dictionary definition does say um, a condition of the body or, or some organ or part, but not everything qualifies as disease. Yeah, that's right. So say pregnancy uh, is a health uh, condition, but it's not a disease. Uh, likewise, injury is not a disease. Right. The other aspect of health promotion charity is this concept of promoting prevention or control of the disease. So with a clear understanding of what we mean by disease, which as you mentioned is pretty consistent with what most people think of disease anyway, what are we talking about when we say promotion or promoting the prevention or control of disease? Right, so again, uh, promote uh, and prevention and control take their ordinary meaning, so they're very broad meanings. Yep. Promote, um, we take, um, to be quite an extensive uh, range of activities. Yep. Um, so this is where uh, HPC differs from PBI in that you could be undertaking um, lobbying government or awareness raising education of the general public on disease or research and these would all uh, fall within uh, the scope of what a health promotion charity does. Um, so to promote includes all those those types of activities. Okay, so whereas a PBI, we mentioned that those sorts of activities, lobbying government or broad awareness raising, lack the clear mechanism for providing um, automatic relief of the needs that it was trying to relieve. In the case of a health promotion charity, the word promote is important, so those sorts of activities can fall within. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so the, the the definition of prevention is obviously much broader than uh, relief activity, so um, it encompasses all of those uh, types of activities that can have a, a downstream effect, uh, like education and um, lobbying. Yeah, right. And just um, to before we move on, the last dot point here I think is worth um, just clarifying a little bit does not apply to general health and wellbeing programs, must relate um, to identified disease. So in the case of an organisation that maybe promotes healthy eating and the benefits of regular exercise and offers some uh, subsidised personal training classes to promote general health, that wouldn't fit within this category. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so uh, promoting exercise can uh, Know, ha have an effect of ultimately preventing disease, but the actual activity, if it's focused on exercise, is not the prevention, the promotion of the prevention and control of disease. Um, likewise, with um, mental health, um, there's some uh, activities like uh, positive psychology, okay. which are focused on improving in everyone's general mental health. Um, and I'm sure we can all improve in that way, but that doesn't, doesn't mean that we have a disease or a mental illness. Yeah, right. Okay. <clears throat> One more thing to look at for HPCs is this concept of a principal activity. In the PBI section just before, we mentioned the idea of a main purpose and um, the, the, the need to show that the main purpose is directed at benevolent relief. In the case of an HPC, a principal activity is an important consideration. Can you just describe what we mean by this? Sure. Yeah, so again, this is less restrictive than uh, with PBI in that um, you can have an independent purpose or activity that's not focused on disease. Um, pr the principal activity just means the activity that outweighs all the other activities. Oh, okay. So if you, if you took a tally of the stuff you do and the one that you do the most, yeah. That, that would fit the definition of principal activity. That's right. Right. So the second dot point here, an HPC can undertake other activities, um, but the activity that promotes must be the principal. The other activities, are they? Are there any restrictions on the other activities that they can do? Uh, only that they have to be 
the in furtherance of a charitable purpose okay. um, in order to meet the requirements to be registered as a charity. But it doesn't have to be for health. So they could do some other things that are perfectly charitable. For example, um, they uh, advance education or they are advancing the, um, the protection of the natural environment or something that is charitable but isn't related to the health promotion activities. That's is right. That okay. Yeah, that, that, that's uh, that's fine. And that's where it does really deviate from the PBI requirements. Yes. Okay. Let's have a look at. Um, oh, just before we move on, actually, down the bottom here, I've been reminded by the, the URLs that popped up. acnc.gov.au forward slash HPC is a thorough fact sheet on a comprehensive fact sheet on the health promotion charity category and. Again, as I mentioned, the Commissioner's Interpretation Statement on PBI, there is one for HPCs as well. So if you go to acnc.gov.au forward slash CIS, you will find a Commissioner's Interpretation Statement on health promotion charities. Some examples um, of organisations that are commonly registered as health promotion charities, medical research organisations that do research into a disease, raising public awareness about a disease, its causes and, and how people can take action to avoid it, education, educating carers of people with a disease, even providing equipment or aids to help people suffering from a disease. And you'll notice the word disease in all of these dot points and that is, as Al has mentioned, it's worth reiterating, it's the the aspect that sort of underpins the registration as an HPC. It really must be looking at an identified disease and, and how to either prevent it or, or control it. There are a lot of um, applications that come in for HPC that might not um, get up as an HPC and might be disappointed and might be turned away. Whilst it's probably advancing health, it's not within this category. Can you give us some examples out of some of the things that we often see? Okay, uh, so if you're promoting exercise uh, and the benefits of exercise, then that is, um, it's related to health um, and it would qualify as promotion of general health, but it wouldn't qualify as uh, preventing the or uh, controlling disease. So um, it would have to be actually focused on a disease that is caused by a lack of exercise um, right, okay. to be able to qualify as a, an HPC. And as you again, as you mentioned, activities that are designed to just improve general well-being, because there's a lot of that now that people are aware of the importance of general physical and mental well-being, it, it often just falls short of this category. Yeah, that's right. The hint, as we've got here, it may be helpful when thinking about this category and whether or not your organisation does do the things it's required to for this category, it might be helpful to think about it as disease prevention or disease control rather than health promotion. As Al mentioned at the beginning, health promotion charities takes a slightly misleading name and it might be more helpful to call it a disease prevention charity or a disease uh, control charity as a, as a way just to, to shape your thinking and get you um, thinking in the right um, sense about this. Okay, let's just have a quick look now at some of the ACNC requirements. We've listed, this is a broad, a brief summary, so uh, there are some more um, details that you can read up on, of course, but it's worth um, going through these to uh, give you an idea of what we're looking at. For both PBIs and HPCs, it has to meet the standard requirements for charity registration, which is, as Al has mentioned, being not-for-profit, having a charitable purpose, not being a government entity, having no disqualifying purposes. Um, we'll get onto institution in a moment. But first, Al, can you take us through some of these? Um, first, not-for-profit. This might seem simple, but it's worth reiterating. How does an organisation show it's not-for-profit? Okay, so it will usually demonstrate it through its governing documents uh, with a clause that prevents any profit accruing to the members or any associated entities uh, and having a clause 
relating to winding up or when the entity finishes up um, to uh, give all of the assets to uh, a charity or to towards charitable purposes. Okay, so no one can, no people can benefit personally from an organisation closing down by taking on the assets and all the surplus funds. That's right. And just quickly on that, um, there's often some confusion. This is not to say that an organisation can't make a profit. It's that the people, they can't distribute the gains of a profit to the people involved. That's right, yeah. So a for-profit entity makes a profit and then distributes the profit to the private shareholders. Or, right. Um, yeah. So a not-for-profit can make a profit, but it has to um, put all that, all of those assets towards um, its charitable purpose or its, um, its not-for-profit purpose. Okay, important distinction to keep in mind. And charitable purpose, can you just give us a, a quick overview of this? Because it is in legislation, isn't it? Yes, so uh, charitable purpose um, has been set out in the Charities Act, uh, the definition of charity, uh, charitable purpose at uh, section 12, and that includes um, things like advancing health, advancing education, advancing social or public welfare, okay. advancing religion, and a variety of other right. categories. The third one here, it, it can get tricky, and we're not going to go into it too deeply because it could be a full webinar on its own, I think, but a government entity. A, a charity can't be a government entity. What, what do we mean by that? Yes, this is a very complex issue. Um, it's basically where an entity is a creature of government, so where it's um, carrying out a government function or it's uh, under the con control of government. Uh, it may be a government entity. Okay. Um, but it's very complicated and uh, there's a commissioner's interpretation statement uh, devoted to the meaning of government entity. And no disqualifying purposes. Um, this would probably be an unfamiliar term to many people listening. What, what do we mean by disqualifying purposes? Right, so that's again uh, set out in the Charities Act at uh, section 11 and it says uh, it's the purpose of engaging in or promoting activities that are unlawful or contrary to public policy, um, or the purpose of promoting or opposing a political party or a candidate for political office. Okay, right. Um, again, the, the, there's a lot to this and disqualifying purposes can, can get quite detailed as well, but broadly speaking though, they are the two things to think about. Now, evidence to show that an organisation is an institution and not merely a fund or a trust, we've, we've gone over that and there are a range of ways that you can demonstrate that an organize, that your organisation is an institution, but that's requirements for a PBI and an HPC. That wouldn't be a requirement for just a regular charity. That's right. And PBIs and HPCs, can you just um, uh, give us a, a review of those main differences, the requirements for these two, which again are uh, above and beyond that of a regular standard charity. Okay, so a PBI, must be public, it must be providing benevolent relief, and it has to be an institution. Um, so with the benevolent relief, it has to have a main purpose of provision of benevolent relief uh, to people who have really serious needs. Right. So that means that all the purposes must be focused on the relief or must be ancillary or just a means to achieve that relief. Right, and HPCs? Uh, so they are focused on disease. They have to demonstrate that the, they're an institution and that they have a principal activity of promoting the prevention or control of diseases in human beings. And that's one thing we haven't really focused too much on, but the last two words on this slide is in human beings, right? So there are plenty of diseases that affect flora and fauna, but we're looking at diseases in human beings. That's right. Um, we'll have a look at how the ACNC registration process works. So if you are applying for either of these two categories, you have a fair idea. Um, there's an online registration form, of course. You fill in all the details. We receive that and have a look at the details of your organisation. And then once we have made a decision on the category, well, first on whether or not your organisation can be a charity and then uh, under which types it can be registered, including PBI and HPC, 
we send off the details to the Australian Taxation Office who um, make a decision on the tax concessions. Um, from what I understand it, they don't do another check of the charity aspect of it. They take the ACNC's determination and then apply tax concessions based on that um, as a general rule. Of course, there may be the odd case where details suggest otherwise, but, but in general, that's the way it works. Um, Al, I'll just have you explain that this isn't, uh, this isn't collaborative um, process right it's not as if hitting submit on the online application form closes the door and you don't hear about anything for, for weeks no yeah uh, it's definitely a collaborative process so uh, the analyst uh, with your application will contact you and um, discuss the application and if they need any further information they'll they'll talk to you about that and um, talk through any issues and people have a chance to make any changes or adjustments to say their constitution or, or be able to clarify their activities and that sort of thing? That's right, yeah. Okay, um, that brings us to the end of the formal presentation now. We do have some time for questions. We're not gonna hold you up too long. I know that Nicola and Chris, our colleagues, have been busy answering many questions via text and a few good ones have come through that um, we thought were worth sharing with everyone. So if you do have any questions that you'd like us to cover now that the formal presentation is done, um, send them through. We'll try our best to get to all of them. But as I said, if many come through and we, we just simply can't get to all of them, we will um, uh, get in touch with you via email um, to answer your question. But first, Al, one question that has come up um, in relation to PBI, and I guess it would apply to HPC as well, is whether or not activities overseas um, take any different requirements? Right, um, so when an entity is doing activities overseas, there's a, additional risks involved um, with funds going overseas uh, or assets going overseas. So uh, in order to ensure that an entity meets the governance standards, we uh, will ask additional questions relating to um, the risks associated with sending funds or assets overseas or um, carrying out activities overseas. Um, so if an entity is um, dealing with children, there's also additional uh, risk involved there and we will ask additional questions to ensure the, the safety of the children. Okay, so the, the ACNC will, will ask a few extra questions to make sure everything is as it should be, but the uh, sort of the, the bare bones requirements uh, are pretty much the same, right? The, the concept of benevolent relief, and in the case of an HPC, um, prevention, um, oh, sorry, promoting prevention or control of disease. That's right. Yep. Okay, um, one more question has uh, popped up on institution. Is there any um, minimum requirements for the number of people that make up an institution? Do you have to have 10 board members? Does it, does it take any particular requirements? Uh, no, there aren't any minimum requirements, but uh, with uh, PBI, the public aspect of public benevolent institution, um, the courts have looked at um, the, the number of um, responsible persons or me committee members uh, yep. there and uh, we will sometimes look at that if there are questions about the, the public nature of the entity. Okay, just one on the, uh, we, I know we touched on it, we did speak a fair bit about it, this notion of collaboration for a PBI. Um, someone's just asked about the, the details of this and they've mentioned a, a fairly famous case that um, has, that steers much thinking about collaboration. Can you just give us a broad overview of the Hunger Project and how that applies to PBI? Sure, so that was about a fundraising entity and um, it was raising funds and then uh, giving the funds to its associated uh, Hunger Project entities overseas and they were uh, carrying out the benevolent relief. Uh, and the court, um, decided that 
the fundraising entity was a PBI, um, and it, it looked at another decision that uh, word investments, and uh, in that case, um, an entity was raising funds to uh, give towards re religious purposes, advancing mm -hmm. religion, and that was held to be a charity. Um, so following word, word investments, the, the judges in uh, the Hunger Project decisions decided that um, <clears throat> they should take an approach uh, putting substance over, over form and consider um, the consequences of, of fundraising and giving it to the associated entity and decided that there was a clear mechanism for delivering re relief and um, therefore the entity was a, a PBI. Okay, right. So the significance of that being that the, the entity in Australia was, as you described, a fundraising body. It, it wasn't it didn't have um, people on the front line in Australia doing direct relief work within Australian cities. That's right. Yeah, it was it was just doing the fundraising aspect, but um, because it, it shared a common benevolent purpose with the other entities overseas, um, and uh, it was distributing funds which were used solely for carrying out benevolent relief. Right. Then that was um, accepted as. Uh, a PBI. Oh, I, I might just pick your brain on this uh, topic for a little bit for the benefit of people. I think it might be worth um, touching on. For a fundraising entity then, does it have to have a, a sort of formal agreement? If you're a, an independent fundraising entity that um, gives to lots of charities and um, you make the decision about who you give to based on whatever processes you have, but there isn't any particular formal arrangement or, or contract with charities doing benevolent relief. Do you think, is it your sense that that might be a PBI as well, or, or does it really need to have that sort of formal arrangement? Uh, it needs to have uh, a common benevolent purpose with the other entity or entities or it needs to have a relationship of collaboration where it's clear that uh, all the funds used will be used solely for benevolent relief purposes. Okay, right. So it it, it really does need a, a little bit more than just just a, a, an independent, isolated entity. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, right. Okay, and just um, another question has come through on health promotion charity. Um, the, you mentioned that it encompasses uh, mental illnesses as well as physical illnesses, but it doesn't cover the, the concept of general health. Um, someone's asked about the concept of um, meditation and um, uh, mindfulness and the, the clear health benefits that that, that has. Um, I'm, I'm not um, a health professional myself. I don't know what the, the latest research is, but. Is it your sense that something like that would sit pretty close to the to the um, entrance of HPC, or is it still it's still a fair way off? Uh, we would look to um, bodies like the National Health and Medical Research Council and research that they do, um, um, or systematic reviews of um, studies on um, mindfulness or meditation in relation to particular mental illnesses to okay. see if there's uh, uh, enough evidence to show that um, that actually prevents or controls that disease. Right. Oh, and you mentioned disease again. So even even in this case, this hypothetical case, that the organisation would still need to put forward and identify disease that their meditation or mindfulness is um, promote uh, preventing or, or, or controlling it. It can't just be the mindfulness and meditation without the disease. That's right. It would have to be depression or uh, anxiety disorder or um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder or something like that. Yeah, right. Okay. And one more on HPC before we finish up because we're pushing 45 minutes now and I don't want to keep people too long over their lunch break. Um, um, with uh, promoting um, diseases, how does how does the ACNC, actually this would apply to PBI as well, what sort of things does the ACNC 
ask for beyond the standard online application form for an organization to prove that they are um, promoting the prevention or control of disease from HBC or providing benevolent relief for PBI. What sort of things can an organization provide beyond their, their sentences within the online application form? Right. Um, yeah, we may need additional information depending on the circumstances on the activities. So we might request a more detailed description of the activities or uh, might request uh, annual reports or uh, strategic plans or other documents yep. that uh, demonstrate how the entity is is carrying out the purpose. Okay, right. So it depends on the case. That's yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, a few questions coming through and we are trying our best to get to all of them. Some of them, the more specific ones, um, it, it may be worth giving our advice team a call on 132262. Um, in, the, in that case, you, you're much more likely to have the ins and outs of your particular organisation dealt with directly rather than through this um, public webinar forum. And it might be worth noting that there isn't um, a wait to get on the phone for one of our advice services staff as well. So give them a call, 132262, and um, they're very friendly and knowledgeable, and they'll be able to help you out with the details of your particular organisation. Of course, there is lots of information on our website. Um, acnc.gov.au is the homepage, and then you can see some URLs here with some relevant information, PPI, HPC fact sheets, commissioner's interpretation statements, um, obligations, uh, pages that cover DGR and even who can register. So that outlines the requirements of being registered as a charity. The ATO also has a section on their website for non-profits which covers some of the tax concessions and in particular DGR and the requirements of several DGR categories. I know that a lot of people are looking at these categories for the purposes of being registered as a DGR with the ATO so they can offer tax deductible donations um, it might be worth going to that page and having a look at the DGR table which outlines all the categories that the ATO has. Okay, also stay in touch with the ACNC via a number of ways, this commission's column and email updates, web guidance, video content, webinars such as this and give our advice services team a call if you have any particular questions about your organisation and its obligations to the ACNC or its registration as a PBR and HPC. That's 132262. Or you can email us advice at acnc.gov.au and we're pretty big on social media, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and subscribe to our podcasts. Okay, that's a lot of advertising and plugging for ourselves. Um, that's it for today. Um, thank you very much, Al, for taking us through the intricate um, categories of PBI and HPC. Great, thanks, Matt. And thanks to Nicola and Chris who have been frantically answering all the questions via text as we've been going along. Again, apologies if we don't get to your question. Um, we can only answer as many as we can answer and we will endeavour to send you an email to answer your question um, later on. If you have any feedback for the webinars, this is separate to questions about PBI and HPC in your registration application. If you have any feedback about webinars specifically or any web guidance or anything like that, give us an email at education at acnc.gov.au. And that's it for today. Whoops.